I recently finished a pair of handmade 1920s shoes, inspired by, of course, Downton Abbey. And in today's video, I'm going to be bringing you along for the making journey of these shoes. I'll be showing you my original shoe inspiration from 1922 or so. I'll show you how I selected and built up a last to fit me. Also, some mistakes I made in that area. How I created the patterns for the shoes, cut out the leather, stitched the uppers, and even how I carved the wooden high heels for these shoes. Now stay tuned till the end of the video for the final reveal of the shoes and to hear how they fit and how I like them. If you are interested in shoemaking, I have a few other mostly historical shoemaking videos on this channel that I will link for you in the description. If you are interested more in the making process of these shoes from the 1920s, check out the accompanying blog post which will be linked in the description and will have the whole written version of the making process along with photos. Okay, so I bought my shoe last from Lisa Sorrell's site. It was actually a cowboy boot last, but it was a reproduction of a vintage last and had a very similar shape to that which I was trying to create. And these are the beautiful inspiration shoes that I worked off of. They're from 1922. So for my shoe last, I first had to build them up with leather because I purposely bought them in a narrow width so I could get that nice snug fit in the waist of the last but have enough room for the ball of my foot and for my heel. I then wrapped the last in masking tape and drew on some important landmarks before carefully cutting off the masking tape mold of the last. And this would form the basis for our pattern. A pattern in shoemaking is called a last standard, and that is the basic foundation for making any shoe pattern for a given pair of lasts. And so I'm laying down that masking tape mold onto paper and cutting around it. And so I created masking tape molds of both sides and then formed it into an average of both sides from which I created my working pattern which had a lasting allowance at the bottom and I drew on all the style lines that I would want in this particular pair of shoes. and then I separate it into the different pieces of the pattern. And I made a mock-up out of fabric. Okay, so I'm cutting out my pattern pieces. So I'm just tracing around the cardstock pattern pieces with leather pen, marking the stitching lines. And now I'm going to be cutting them out. And also cutting out my lining leather, which was quite thin, so I just used scissors. And here are all of my outer leather pieces cut out. And here are all of the inner components of the shoes. And now it's time to start skiving. Skiving is a process used in all kinds of leather work where you use a sharp knife to thin down the edges of the leather. Now I'm applying some double-sided shoemaking tape and cutting some relief cuts in the very edge of this vamp because I'm going to be folding this edge under. This is very commonly done in any type of higher-end shoemaking because it creates a more polished appearance. And the most finicky part of of this was of course folding the edges of the straps but I could tell from the original that they had done this in the original and I wanted to try my best to recreate it. And now taking it to my brand new and much loved shoemaking machine to stitch that in place. And I just kept gluing or taping on the pieces because of course pins aren't usually used in shoemaking, and then stitching it at the machine. And 
And the final step is of course adding our buckle. This is an antique buckle from 1925. And here are our finished shoe uppers. step is creating our insole. So I cut out my insole leather with a lot of extra margin and I got it wet and I just molded it to the shape of the last. And once it's dry the next day I'm removing that and using a knife to trim off the edges. Flush to the edges of the last. Just using some more precise knife strokes at the waist of the shoe last there. So there is the finished insole. You can see how nicely it takes the shape of the last. So I'm using a technique that was used historically, which is of creating a cardboard shank for these shoes. The shank is the area of the shoe that supports the arch of the foot, especially in high heel shoes. And I'm copying a technique used by the very talented shoemaker here on YouTube, Nicole Rudolph, and I will link her video where I first saw this technique in the description. So I layered up the cardboard to create a very supportive insole shape, and I'm just rasping the edges to make it smooth and streamlined. And there's the finished insole and shank, and it turned out to be very supportive and very structured. Okay, so here are insoles and we're ready for the next step, which is lasting. Just want to give lip service to this wonderful shoemaking book, Bespoke Shoemaking. I will put the title and author in the description. It really helped me out a lot through this shoemaking process and helped me up my shoemaking game quite a bit. So I'm using a technique that he recommends in his book, which is where you add the heel counter, which is the stiffener, which will reinforce the heel. You add that in to the uppers before beginning lasting. This was very, very new to me, but I took him on his word and tried it out. And now I'm beginning the lasting process. I'm using my lasting pliers to pull the uppers down over the insole accuracy is very important here and it's a very very finicky process and now i'm just adding my toe stiffener which is another piece of the same leather i used as the stiffener in the heel and this just holds the shape of the toe So now I'm just using my knife to streamline up the bottom of that stiffener, cutting off all the lumps and bumps before taking my rasp and rasping all over the toe puff to get it smooth and streamlined under the shoe. Before doing the final lasting of the upper over top of that and adding my paste, which will create a nice stiff shape in the toe puff. wetting down that upper to get it to mold to shape before lasting it. Hi guys, so I just wanted to come to you raw in the moment here to describe something vastly horrible that has happened in my shoemaking endeavors and any of you who make things I'm sure will be able to understand my pain whether or not you do shoemaking. So look at this right here. Honestly, I don't know if it's showing up as much as does it justice, but I'm sure you can see those dark areas. Those are areas where the coating of the leather appears to have peeled off. And I didn't know this would happen. The reason why this happened is because I got the leather wet. This is veg tanned leather. So the procedure I've seen most often used in lasting veg tanned leather uppers is to get it wet because it's not as soft and pliable as chrome tan leather, and when you get it wet, you can mold it to a certain shape, such as the last, and then it will hold that shape. 
So that's why I was doing it. And especially because this particular last is so curvy, I really needed to get it wet to get it to form to the shape. But I found through the worst of ways that when it gets wet and then it's under any sort of pressure or touching, which of course I was having to touch it and hammer it a bit to get it to hold the shape, this coating on the leather, it appears to have some sort of like leather paint coating, which makes sense based on the finish type of this leather. It appears to be peeling off when it's wet and it's getting rubbed. And actually I'm not showing you the other upper right now because it's not very accessible, but even a larger area peeled off. Now that being said, it looks a bit worse than it actually is right now because it's currently wet. And I have noticed that when these spots dry, when the whole leather dries, the spots aren't quite as dark. They're more of a matching color, but you can still tell the difference, especially in the other one where the spot is much bigger. And I'll just see if I can show you. I hope you can see that. It's really quite a large area where the coating got peeled off. That literally upset me so much. It put me into like a physical illness for a couple days that I'm still getting over. And honest, obviously the illness could have been due to germs or whatever, but I honestly chalk it up to all the stress that this shoe making thing put me through. Like when you put so much work into to creating like as perfect as possible of a leather upper and then you're lasting it and then something like this happens, it's just horrifying. <sighs> I've been trying to tell myself this is a learning experience. It's just practice. It's kind of like going to shoemaking school, except actually doing it through learning through doing. But at the same time, I've been so excited to have these shoes and to be able to wear them in my daily life and to events that I have coming up. So it is really disappointing. Okay, so here is where my lovely Angelus leather paint collection comes in handy. I worked with these two colors, chocolate and cognac, and went back to my long lost painting skills and color mixing skills to try to mix a color that would match as closely as possible the color of my leather. Of course, testing this on some scrap leather. And so here's my poor shoe. And it's the moment of truth, seeing if I'll be able to cover up those spots. And miracle of miracles, this worked so much better than I ever expected it would. And the spots are completely invisible after doing this fix. And I am so thrilled about that. So at this point, my morale was much improved and I was able to move on to the final steps of making these shoes. Okay, so it's time to add the sole. So I prepped the shoe by first gluing in some scrap fabric. I used velvet because it's squishy into the hollow area and I used a rasp to rough up the leather that would be later adhered to the sole. And here's where I carved my wooden heels. So I roughly cut them out of wood and used a die grinder to gradually shape them before giving them a final sanding. And they turned out quite well for my second pair of wooden heels, if I do say so myself. And so this was a tricky part. It's where you have to wrap your wooden heel in matching leather. And the trick is, it's not really a good idea to wet your leather. Wetting would make it much easier, but the glue wouldn't stick if the leather was wet. So I went in this with dry leather and used a bone folder to try to scrape all of those wrinkles out. And it ended up working pretty well, but it was challenging. Now I'm going in with my contact cement outdoors and gluing that heel in place. Now I'm prepping my outsole. I'm using a thick soling leather and prepping the edges by thinning them down and sanding them. Here I am cutting out my heel bottom piece and using the leather paint again to just paint the edges of the soles a matching color to the shoes going with my, my contact cement, cementing the soles in place onto the shoes. Now you can see that these soles have an extra piece at the bottom that is meant to fold down around the breast of the heel. 
So as you can imagine, this is a little tricky, but the final result is well worth it. And just hammering that in place, and for good measure, I gave it a tie just to make sure those edges were well adhered. And finally, it was time to remove the shoe lasts. This took a lot longer than the video shows. And the one last step was to add in some nails to hold in, to hold the heel in place from the inside before adding in the sock liner to the inside of the shoe to neaten it all up. Let's get on to the fit of these shoes. So let's give a bit of background here. First of all, in modern shoemaking, the last, the shoe last that is, should represent almost exactly the shape and size of the person's foot that the shoe is being made for. Why is this? It's because most modern shoes are fairly stiff and structured, which means that they need to give the foot enough room because if they don't, it's going to really hurt and really damage the person's foot. Now let's contrast this to the shoemaking of the 18th and 19th and even early 20th centuries. In these times, shoes were much softer and more flexible. They were made from softer and more flexible and stretchy leathers, and they just didn't believe that shoes needed to be structured in the same way that we view shoes should be today. All of that meant that lasts didn't need to be as wide as they are today. In fact, the last could actually be smaller in width than the person's actual foot since because the shoes were thinner and more flexible, they needed to fit snugly and fit like a second skin. Okay, so the last pair of shoes I made were from the 1820s and they were made on a hand carved last that I carved myself and if you look at that shoe last it was ridiculously narrow and keep in mind that i have wider than average feet and yet these boots still turned out fitting me just fine and that's because they were made in a more historical manner with no stiffeners and with very thin stretchy leather so the big difference between that pair of boots from the 1820s versus this pair of shoes that i just made from the 1920s was the use of stiffeners in the 1920s shoes if you forget what stiffeners are just go ahead and head on back to that timestamp and check it out but basically stiffeners are an extra piece of leather that are involved in the toe area and the heel area of the shoe and they're there is paste applied to them to make them dry very stiffly and I underestimated how much extra width my shoe last would need to have given the fact that I was using these stiffeners this time. 
That being said, the shoe, although it was tight to begin with, especially on my right foot, which is a bit larger than my left, they have thankfully stretched and they feel pretty much how they should be at this point after several wearings, so that's good. The stretching has caused some wrinkling across the vamp, especially of the right shoe, but it's not the end of the world and I'm going to keep in mind what I learned for the next time I make a pair of shoes on this last, I'll just build it up to be a little bit more wide with some leather. Okay everyone, thanks so much for watching. If you liked this video, give it a like, leave your comments and questions below, or share it with people that you think might be interested in this. Check out the written article on this making process, which will be linked in the description. And I also have an email newsletter on my blog that you can sign up for to get my weekly newsletter and updates of what I'm doing. Be sure to check out my other shoemaking videos, which are linked in the description, as well as all my social media accounts. If you'd like more real-time updates of what I'm working on, be sure to follow me on Instagram. And thanks again for watching and joining me on this shoemaking journey.